Reverend Dr. Derek Nelson is professor of religion and a theologian and historian of Christianity. Additionally, he teaches courses in religion and culture, social ethics, and anything else students want to study with him, including immersion classes with trips to Europe, Africa, and South America. Nelson is the author or editor of 10 books, including the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Martin Luther. This multi-volume work is the state of the field resource and comprises cooperation from 122 scholars around the world. His intellectual biography of Martin Luther, co-written with his deceased mentor, Timothy Lull, is resilient performer, the life and thought of Martin Luther. He has written about 50 articles, essays in books, and reviews. He served on the task force that produced a social statement for the ELCA, in which he is an ordained pastor, called The Church and Criminal Justice, Hearing the Cries. After graduating summa cum laude from Wabash College in 1999, Nelson earned his MDiv at Yale Divinity School and a PhD in Systematic and Philosophical Theology at the Graduate Theological Union and the University of California in Berkeley. He taught at Teal College in Greenville, Pennsylvania for six happy years and was a visiting scholar at Oxford University in 2013. Nelson also directs the Wabash Pastoral Leadership Program, which serves an ecumenical group of Indiana pastors who are developing as civic leaders. He holds the Stephen S. Bowen Professorship in the Liberal Arts. He belongs to the Indiana Kentucky Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. He brews beer, he makes furniture, he loves to play golf and catch fish. He and his wife, Reverend Kelly Nelson, are the proud parents of Madeline. And after this event, I encourage you to peruse the titles that are available. He has graciously offered to sign any books that you would like him to sign. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Derek Nelson. That person just described feels a lot more interesting than I am. So uh, I hope I don't uh, let you down too much. Well, thank you um, to, to both of you for, the, for that welcome and for that um, contextualization of, of um, this important and, uh, and um, honorable series. Thanks to all of you for coming, especially when class just ended 15 minutes ago for many of you. Um, appreciate that. Thanks to the seminary for inviting me to speak with you tonight and tomorrow. So this is my first time ever in Memphis. When the e email invitation came, I thought, what do I know about Memphis? Well, barbecue, yeah. El yeah. Elvis, yeah. Um, Protestant theology, <laughs> to name uh, three of my favorite things. Four <laughs> if you count barbecue twice, which maybe we should. <laughs> I also happened to be with my friend David King uh, the next day and mentioned that this had, the invitation had come and he gave me an earful about how much he loved Memphis Seminary, so he sends his greetings as well. Well, this has been a big year for Reformation scholars, celebrating 500 years since something important, we know not exactly what, happened in October of 1517. So having written a biography of Martin Luther as well as several other historical books and this massive 3,000-page uh, encyclopedia of Luther. It weighs 15.4 pounds. I put it on the scale when it came in the mail. My mailman complained. Uh, you might think that I would be sick of this guy, but nothing can be further from the truth. He is the sort of person, and the movement is the sort of thing, that gets more and more mysterious the more you look at it. And all kinds of other non-sort of academic things have come up too, including, I had to borrow this from my daughter. This is a Martin Luther 500th anniversary music box that I picked up in Germany two months ago. I'll play it here. Anybody recognize that? A mighty fortress. Just last night on NCIS TV show, I don't know if everybody saw this, there was a suspect uh, whose car was identified by a, uh, a, a red flower and the number 500 on it. And the astute uh, police officer recognized that as a Luther Rose. It's the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. 
And I fell asleep before I found out if he did it or not. So, uh, was he innocent? Did anybody see? I assume he was innocent. Lutherans are good. So. But the trick to keeping it fresh is to ask the right questions. Not merely just about what actually happened, but also about what actually matters. Tom Wright suggested recently that the problem with biblical studies these days is that it keeps asking uh, 16th century questions and giving 19th century answers. He wants to give 1st century answers to 21st century questions. So I won't weigh in on whether he's successful in that, but I take his point. Um, so when, when the invitation came to think about this, um, the significance, the continuing significance of the Reformation for today, it was clear to me that what we need to look at is today, what it is and what it needs in order to sift through the legacy of wheat and chaff from the Reformation in general and from Luther in particular. So to speak of significance or relevance of things past is always to know something about the present situation. Paul Tillich famously endorsed the method of correlation wherein a theologian saw existential needs of the day raising questions through the arts and through culture, which then Christian theology was to supply the answers for. I've never been quite sure if that really works. Supposedly one evening at a dinner party in the late 1940s, Tillich saw a very modern sculpture <clears throat> sitting in the living room of his host. He analyzed it, remarking on how it reached up to heaven and how part of it was made of glass, but it wasn't really transparent. Hmm, I wonder what that's all about. These circular things affixed to the front of it gave only the illusion of control. His host said, Oh, thank you very much for your analysis, Professor Tillich, not having the heart to tell him that the thing was actually a brand new television set. <laughs> So instead, I think one can do a method of correlation, uh, not with an interpretation of art as to what's important, but uh, tonight I'll take a very unartful source, the United States military. In their quadrennial review from 2014, the United States military identifies global climate change as the most urgent issue facing not just American security interests, but the worldwide global community itself. Quoting somewhat at length from the military's report, something that I never thought I would do in my life, uh, they think that, and they are uh, even today uh, setting their priorities based on this insight. Quote, climate change poses a significant challenge for the U.S. and the world at large. As greenhouse gas emissions increase, sea levels are rising, Average global temperatures are increasing, and severe weather patterns are accelerating. Hmm, sounds about right. These changes, coupled with other global dynamics, including growing, urbanizing, more affluent populations, and substantial economic growth in India, China, Brazil, and other nations, will devastate homes, land, and infrastructure. <coughs> Climate change will exacerbate water scarcity and lead to sharp increases in food costs. The pressures caused by climate change will influence resource competition while placing additional burdens on economies, societies, and governance institutions around the world." Unquote. So this is what I find myself thinking about in terms of what would be useful, even needful, to recover from this great theological inheritance from the Reformation and from Luther. So, what I'm going to do tonight is to talk about the current day, mostly, and leave Luther pretty much for tomorrow. Is that okay? Do you trust me that I promise this will somehow eventually come around to Luther? If so, could you just say, we trust you, Derek? We trust you, Derek. Oh, I feel better. Thank you. Okay. So, hopefully, this will be the situation um, for today, that our primary challenge is to think about how to protect love, and care for a material world under threat by our way of life. It's this pressing need that sends me scurrying to the theological and cultural upheavals of the 16th century. So I'll start with a sweeping, sweeping generalization. Humans experience anxiety 
under the conditions of sin in different forms throughout history. How's that sit with you? Possible? So in the 16th century, there's all kinds of indications that humans were experiencing anxiety as guilt. Therefore, they wanted to be able to do something that would remove this overwhelming sense of shame and guilt and unworthiness. And so the early church heresy that was a kind of temptation in the 16th century was Pelagianism. In case you've forgotten that $4 theological word, Pelagius was an opponent of Augustine or Augustine, same person, uh, in the 5th century. He thought Augustine's radical understanding of grace let humans off the hook. God gave us possibilities, Pelagius argued, Jose, but humans had to will and then carry out, vele and facere, those possibilities in order to be saved. Augustine's view, of course, won out that God saves without respect to human efforts or human merits. And in some ways, that debate got rehashed again in the Reformation. One great historian even called the Reformation uh, Augustine's doctrine of grace versus Augustine's doctrine of the church, Protestants versus Catholics. That's too much, but it kind of gets at the issue. So things have changed, I think. I could be persuaded otherwise, and I hope they'll try to do so if you think I'm wrong. But it seems to me that a closer diagnosis for today would be that humans experience anxiety as hopelessness, not guilt, hopelessness. As opioids continue to ravage our cities, countryside, our politics become darker and more apocalyptic as more and more people contemplate the severity of our climate's degradation, it's kind of amazing how quickly people move from near ignorance to momentary awareness to instant hopelessness. <laughs> we're just, we're screwed in the blink of an eye. The temptation uh, besets us to try to escape from this, from this veil of tears, to think of ourselves as being at home somewhere else, not here. And the early church knew this heresy as Gnosticism. So I'm not here to talk about Gnosticism per se. I'm sure many on your faculty know more about that than I do. Um, I'm just trying to be evocative, trying to paint a broad <coughs> brush. The Gnostics, some of whom thought of themselves as Christians and others who did not, flourished in the Mediterranean world uh, just in the centuries just before and after Christ. They believed in a world neatly divided between good and evil. Bodies were generally bad, but minds and spirits were good. Some Gnostics took the approach that if the body didn't matter, you can do whatever you want to with it. You should go to the parties that those Gnostics um, threw. <laughs> Other Gnostics were ascetic and said, no, bodies aren't indifferent, they're bad, they're to be disciplined, so that we can focus on learning or gnosis. A frequent trope in Gnostic texts was that the earth and the material world was not the true home of the enlightened. One text is called the Hymn of the Pearl. It tells the story of a great prince, a heavenly prince, who wandered away from his heavenly home and ended up in Egypt. The locals mistreat him there and regard him as a foreigner. His parents realize what has happened and they send him a magic letter that brings him uh, back from his nightmare and calls him home. So that story conveys the basic Gnostic theme. If some people, the members of this true spiritual elite, feel out of place in this world, it's because they are. They have forgotten their true selves. They've become enmeshed in bodies, stuck in this lousy material world. I think something sort of like this seems to be the spiritual temptation for many in the United States today especially those of my students' generation. The material world of physical stuff is increasingly regarded as irrelevant for one's true identity, which has more to do with what is virtual and what is consumable, rather than taking delight in the wonder of the created material world. This concerns me as a scholar of the Reformation, as a Christian minister, and frankly, as a father of a three-year-old 
who would like to see her delight in the wonders of the world for quite some time. And if the U.S. military is right, we're in trouble. So if you just remember one sentence from the whole lecture tonight, Nelson's saying Luther's theology of justification is great if the issue is Pelagianism, but Luther's theology of creation is more important when the temptation is Gnosticism. There's all kinds of good reasons to take care of the earth and to be concerned with material stuff. I see many in my students' generation going with one or another of them. Some of them feel incredibly guilty not to do so. There's this kind of visceral uh, uh, hatred of not recycling. You can just see them with their aluminum can and there's only a garbage around this. Can't do it. Um, I remember seeing my grandfather, a, a wonderful, kind man, by the way, just casually throw a candy wrapper uh, out the window of my car as I drove down the highway. And I was just completely shocked by this. How could a good person do that? It made me feel sort of ashamed, viscerally confused. Feeling guilty is, is a good thing. You'll never hear a Lutheran say otherwise. <laughs> but I don't think that feeling guilty about um, harming the earth is enough to overcome this sense of estrangement or alienation from the material world. Another argument is um, something like enlightened self-interest. Um, it's better for us in the long run to take care of the earth, that it has to be our home whether we like it or not. Businesses used to wonder whether they could afford the additional costs of being green, but now they really think about the opposite. So I think those are okay arguments, but as Wendell Berry has persuasively argued for years, all those strategies are limited because they omit affection. We will not fight to protect what we don't intimately, deeply love. And we can't love what we don't know, and we can't know that from which we are estranged. And contemporary American culture increasingly makes it easier and easier to believe the lie that the facticity, the givenness of the material world of physical stuff truly does and should impinge on daily lives. Now I want to make perfectly clear that I am not a Luddite, nor am I adding my list to the long, uh, my name to the list of people who just complain constantly about millennials. It is true that I did turn 40 this year, so I'm worried that I'm just getting crabby. Um, when I was talking with my wife about what I planned to come to Memphis to say, she said, good lord, you sound like Andy Rooney. <laughs> so I hope that's not true, uh, but it might be just for this first part. I think actually some technological advances are really going to be part of the solution to some of these problems. But it just is shocking to me as I think about how estranged from the physical world of material stuff it is now possible to live. So as a way of talking about this estrangement from the material world, I thought I'd organize the rest of uh, this talk as a kind of tour of a house, a typical house. I just read a lovely little book recently by Bill Bryson called uh, Home, A Short History of Private Life or something like that. Bryson was living in England at the time, and his employer supplied him uh, a house. It was a Church of England rectory built in 1853. And he realized that there were all kinds of things about domestic life that he didn't understand. Um, like, why was this room arranged like this? And he was told, well, that was the scullery. Well, what's a scullery? Well, that's where you'd wash your dishes. Well, why wouldn't they just wash your dishes in the kitchen? Are you insane? No, I, I didn't think so. <laughs> I have no idea what that's for. So the, the house has like 20 rooms, and the book is 20 chapters with the backstory on how things in the room got to be that way. Why is there salt and pepper on the table in the kitchen and not salt and allspice? It's very interesting. Uh, so I thought we could sort of do that, take a tour of a typical house, and think together about how irrelevant all kinds of um, important things about the physical world we can ignore, pretend don't matter. Maybe think of your home, I'll think of mine, and just think about this alienation, by which I mean not just 
removed from the urgency of material needs in a kind of post-caveman uh, sort of way, but that we see the material world as sort of alien, as foreign, inhospitable to who we really are. So before we get to this house, we got to know the address, right? And we've become completely estranged from our place names. You know, the definition of a suburb is a place where you cut down trees and name streets for them. <laughs> but we've also forgotten that place names are often meaningfully tied to physical features. A hundred years ago, everybody in town would know that Bridge Street runs perpendicular to whatever river is in town. Because that's not just a six-letter name for a street, that's the street that takes you to and then over the bridge. But GPS devices, as well as urbanization and all kinds of other reasons, have made us think about it simply as a name. Or Mill Street. Mill Street in any town will almost certainly run parallel to whatever the river is, because it's the road that you take to get to the mill, which is on a river. I live on something called Halfway Road. When we bought the house, I asked my neighbors what I was halfway to, and they didn't know. So then I said, well, what are we halfway from? They didn't know that either. <laughs> Incidentally, and I, I don't want to embarrass my sister, but I guess I sort of embarrassed my wonderful grandfather. Uh, blessed memory, I guess I'll keep it even. Uh, I went to visit my sister at her rural Minnesota college uh, a few, quite a few years ago. She was living off campus in a house called Graceland. She gave me directions and she said, you go, you go down College Avenue, and then you take a left onto Grace Street, and then when you get to Land Avenue, you stop and it's at the corner. So wanted to be funny, as you can tell I'm not, but I do try. Uh, I said, well, why do they call it Graceland? And she said, I don't know. I guess it's because there's a picture of Elvis in the hallway. <laughs> but this same kind of dynamic of just forgetting that there's a root for, uh, for why we call something what we do. I wonder how many of my students know what they're talking about when they CC an email. Carbon copy used to refer to a piece of paper. Now it's just a hypothetical, you know, intellectual thing. Or when I was writing my outline for this talk, I went to the top left corner of Microsoft Word and I clicked the save icon. What's the save icon in Microsoft Word? A floppy disk, a 3.5 inch floppy disk that none of my students has ever used. <laughs> 20 years ago, they were discontinued. Uh, I was going to hang up my phone, and I realized, well, I'm not hanging up my phone. I'm just pushing this red button. Why do I call it hanging up my phone? The voicemail icon is little sprockets, like from a tape that you would have had in a tape years ago. The television icon in Chrome and Firefox is a little image of a screen with, like, rabbit ears, like a Paul Tillich sculpture. Well, I could go on with lots of these examples uh, for a long time. I'm sure Andy Rooney would. But I think you see the point that I'm making. Our estrangement from the physical world of material things is pervasive in our symbol systems, in our daily lives, in the way we interpret everything that happens to us. Okay, so our house has an address. Let's go up onto it. We walk up maybe onto the porch, although fewer houses have them now. I read a fascinating book a few years ago by a sociologist who was trying to understand the effects of air conditioning on Southern culture. I have a pretty exciting life, don't I? Well, he made the point that when people used to sit outside to stay cool in the summers, all kinds of conversations happened. Oral histories got told. Neighbors knew each other. Regional, even local, distinctiveness flourished. Air conditioning changed that. Skyscrapers now can be built in places like Atlanta, Charlotte, maybe Memphis. Banks moved south to occupy them, so industry changed. Retirees flocked to Florida and Texas like never before. Porches were no longer needed. We now feel almost entitled to live in comfort. The slightest twinge of overheating leads us to the thermostat. It makes our bodies, but maybe also our hearts, just a little bit colder. This sociologist was harsher than I would want to be. He said, and I quote, General Electric has been an even worse invader of Southern culture than was General Sherman. 
Well, as we walk inside our house, we might come to the kitchen. It's here that the shock of how alienated from the material world we have become hits me hardest. Thinkers from the left, the right, and from everywhere in between have helped us see the folly of modern American cuisine. I say cuisine, but that's hardly an apt description. A cuisine means not just the spices used in cooking and the dishes that you make, but also the way that life in the material world makes that cuisine possible. So there's a seafood cuisine in coastal towns that can't be separated from the runs of fish. I had a great cookbook called Monastery Soups. It was, uh, it was organized by month, stuff that was likely to be fresh and available. In March, you had from the March recipes, and root vegetables that could be stored, you'd eat next December, January. I don't know if I grew up with this or not, my mother didn't cook vegetables so much as punish them, as to say. She's not making fun of my mom. I gotta call my family and apologize. But there still was this sense of a management of a kitchen that's related to natural processes. So I grew up on a farm and we ate in season because we had to. We ate eggs until the hens stopped laying, and then it was roast chicken on Sunday, chicken soup Tuesday, chicken a la king, thicken it up a little bit on Thursday. Uh, this is just so foreign to what most of my students have experienced. It's Mexican on Monday, Italian on Tuesday, Chinese on Wednesday. It's disentangled from, it's not related to the actual physical stuff of your material circumstances. It should feel weird, friends, weird to see fresh raspberries in your grocery store in February or pristine asparagus in October. The average number of cup holders in minivans sold last year, I told my host I was going to make fun of minivans a little bit, 11. 11 cup holders in your average new minivan. The expectation is that the car is where we will eat. Cooking is less a matter of the soul than curation or stewardship of resources. It's more of a chance to show off, or as countless TV cooking competitions imply, to win. And I say this as a person who had a cooking show on San Francisco cable for two years. The loss of oral culture, the loss of hand-me-down recipes, coincides also with the rise in fast food. A Belgian theologian who shall remain nameless blames Martin Luther for all that, by the way. <laughs> He's the one who brought about individualism, and fast food means have it your way. He even called Luther's uh, sacramental theology Mick Eucharist. But, uh, as I said, let's not go there. As our nation wonders why we're asked to pay so much for health care costs, it's also worth asking why we're so sick. Incidence of diabetes is absolutely skyrocketing. The cornfields of my home in Indiana are helping us. 40% of Americans alive right now are expected to become diabetic. If you're African American or Latino, it's more like 50%. If you're under 15, the number is closer to 60%. People are living longer with the disease, which is good, but that means that it costs much more to treat. The cost of diabetes alone, unrelated, uh, separated from uh, related health issues like obesity and heart disease, was $245 billion in 2012. The most recent year I could uh, find a number for. Of course, it's much higher now. Sugar and fats are rare in nature. The psalmist goes on and on about honey because that's one of the few natural places to find it. To expect that a Snickers bar tastes natural is, of course, completely, it's folly. It shows how estranged we are from what, what is actually natural. And I say this in, in the interest of honesty, having eaten a delicious Snickers bar on the airplane on my way here today. <laughs> but on the other hand, I have dinner most every night at a table that I made, sitting on chairs that I made with boards cut from my neighbor's woodlot. We buy a half of beef every other year from our other neighbor. If the sun doesn't shine on our, uh, on our uh, garden, then our tomatoes taste worse, and we accept that. If the frost comes at the wrong time, the apples are wormy, and we accept that. We eat meatless twice a week on purpose, probably more by accident. 
And I'm not saying that everyone has to be like me, but if it makes you feel at home in the world to live like that. It makes you feel that the earth is your home, that uh, some things are right with it. It takes seriously the brute truths of the material world. So at the risk of devolving into even more uh, uh, harangues, let's move away from the kitchen and into the bedroom, away from our national eating disorders and to something else. Uh, pornography is big business. Last year, worldwide, the best estimates put the total at about $97 billion, about an eighth of that coming from the U.S. Google reports that it excludes about 10 to 15 percent of all websites from its basic search results. It wants to keep them um, free of adult content unless you opt otherwise. But in terms of actual traffic, the number is much higher. Estimates range from 37 percent to 68 percent of data transmitted at any one time on the internet is pornographic. So there's lots of reasons to be concerned about this, but I want to focus on one. I have had some admittedly very uncomfortable conversations with Wabash students, all of whom are male, by the way. Wabash is one of two uh, all-male colleges in the country. And many have complained that their consumption of pornography has kind of ruined their sex life. They start to think of sex not merely as, not even merely as pleasure. Christians should want more to come from it than just that, of course, but at least should have that. It's become more like a performance, they say. They wonder how it looks to an observer. They worry that they can't be attracted to a partner unless they're perfectly sculpted or flawless. They confess an embarrassment that they would rather not have sex if the partner were less attractive, or, or not as attractive as, the, as what they've come to expect. They're coming to the rather strange conclusion that sex is not really about delight in the material bodily world, but about status, power, and how one feels about oneself, rather than about how one feels in one's body. The 1960s and 1970s are rightly known as a time of great cultural upheaval in the United States. Certainly Memphis played a huge role there. But it wasn't just those protests about civil rights and war and different forms of music and this awakening of the, of, the, of the country. I've come to see several other features of that cultural revolution who have contributed to this alienation or estrangement from the material world. The availability of birth control, for instance, to say nothing of Roe versus Wade, made it possible to disentangle the act of sex from its material bodily consequences. Other shifts happened too. Perhaps in, your, uh, in the bedroom you're thinking of, there's a piggy bank. In 1971, the uh, United States decided to leave the Bretton Woods International Monetary Policy. Now that had a very interesting effect on the psychology of money. It feels different to have the the dollar tied to something, in this case, a precious metal, versus having it be just hypothetical, just a series of ones and zeros that someone keeps track of somewhere on some computer. I worked my way through college roofing houses in, in Minnesota, and it just feels very different. It felt better to get paid with dirty $100 bills pressed into my dirty hands on Friday afternoon paydays. Now I have direct deposit. And while I'm grateful that the amount deposited is a lot more than it used to be when I was uh, roofing houses, it just feels weird to have the 28th or 29th or something come and go, and then this transaction happens out there somewhere in the ethereal cyberspace world. But what my students were saying was that this curious side effect of a huge consumption of pornography was the Gnostic conclusion that they aren't their bodies. To see this from a slightly different angle, let's step out of the house for a bit. You can see you're all relieved. Uh, we'll go outside. The Atlantic had this fascinating article two years ago called The Overprotected Kid that began with an alarming finding. The nation's leading organization of orthopedic surgeons 
was growing very concerned about steady increases in juvenile long bone fractures. So that's femurs and humeruses, humeri, humeruses, arms, arms and legs broken, and children's bodies. The numbers uh, increased every year from 1985 to 2010, and the rate of increase was also increasing. They tried to get to the bottom of this. Why is this happening? And they discovered quite conclusively why. The answer might surprise you. It's playgrounds. Major childhood injuries, like head traumas, happened on a few playgrounds that led to lawsuits against cities whose playground equipment was unsafe. I think patient zero, so to speak, in this was Chicago. So it was for very good reasons that jungle gyms were lowered. Mulch and uh, like ground up rubber, you have that here, gets put there instead of the pavement that you just bounce your head on, I guess, uh, before. But what the orthopedists found was that in a kind of weird way, it's important for a child to fall and hurt himself a little bit in a safe environment so that he'll learn the limits of his body. It's good to take a risk and maybe fail. You'll scrape a knee, maybe, or twist an ankle. But more importantly, you'll know your body and what it can withstand and what it cannot. Bike helmets, ever more elaborate child safety restraints in cars and the like, also developed right around this time. Now, obviously, the safety improvements are not debatable in terms of those policies intended and stated goals of reducing injuries. I'm all for that. But with every advance, there's a cost. And I think this kind of alienation from one's own body is an inconvenient side effect of a necessary measure. So speaking of play, let's go back inside to the house. Let's go to the living room. There's a big TV in there. The average teen spent nine hours per day looking at a monitor in 2015. I'm assuming that most of what they were doing was reading theology articles written by yours truly and the Memphis Theological Seminary faculty. So let's assume that trend is fine. Uh, of course, there's a comfy couch in the living room also. That's what we should really be worried about. Worried about. They say sitting is the new smoking. Have you heard that? The, the sedentary lifestyle that so many, uh, so many live. I mentioned my three-year-old. You can imagine the number of toys strewn about the room. Unfortunately, this is not always the case in our digital world. Neurologists just a few months ago described a new disease. It's called, I have to read this here, hypoplasticity dyspraxia. Hypoplasticity dyspraxia. Motor skills are in your, in your muscles, in your extremities, but fine motor skills are in your brain. And there's a short window in children when most of that wiring happens. And when too much of that time is spent swiping left or right on a screen and not playing with the physical objects of the material world, the wiring doesn't happen right, and the brain is actually damaged. As a woodworker, I've come to at least uh, lament that the furniture in your living room is less likely than ever to have come from the trees growing in your neck of the woods. No pun intended. About 3% of all home furnishings sold in the U.S. in 2015 were made from intact wood. 3%. The rest was plastic, metal, or worse, from my view, sawdust glued together with chemical preservatives and slapped with cheap veneers. As a descendant of Swedish stock, I really should like IKEA. I try so hard to like IKEA, but I have a hard time with it. To know that we surround ourselves with material objects that we regard as disposable items just seems uh, bad, not for my side woodworking business, but bad for our souls as well. A best-selling book of a few years ago summed this up quite well. It was called Shop Class as Soulcraft by Matthew Crawford. Crawford had a prestigious PhD in philosophy from the University of Chicago, and he moved to Virginia to work in a think tank. After being consistently pressured to deny climate science, the think tank was funded by the Koch brothers, Crawford quit, he got out of academia, and he went to work at his first love, 
fixing motorcycles. He loved it. He reflected on why that work was so much more satisfying, to say nothing of more lucrative, which it also was. He noted how many school curricula were changing in the 1970s and 1980s, at that time period again. Shop class and home economics were removed from high schools. The knowledge economy is the new thing, and everyone needed to be in college prep to get ready for it. But then this funny thing of globalization happened, and all kinds of those jobs in the knowledge economy got outsourced uh, to different countries. If you want to build a high rise in the US, you can outsource the architectural drawing, but the welder has to be actually there on site. Now, Crawford's point isn't just uh, an occupational or economic one. In fact, I think the more captivating parts of that book have to do with one's basic orientation to the world, when it's attentive to the material realities around us. It just felt empowering for Crawford to be able to turn those wrenches and fix the motorcycle motor. These are kind of primitive, sort of straightforward objects. And he contrasts that with how completely disempowering it is to open up a motherboard of thousands of circuits that you have no idea what they do or how they work or how to fix it. I remember um, being so proud of a, a friend of my dad's who was an amazing television repairman in the 1980s and how sad it was when he went unemployed because no one fixes televisions anymore. They're just disposable goods. Or waving your hands in this sort of furious, impotent rage as the infrared sensors at the airport bathroom don't see your hands. So you're just waving them around the sink like a total idiot. Have any of you had this experience or is it just me? It's happened to me three times today in different airports. It's just completely disempowering. It, you start to feel like the world is a mysterious, inhospitable place at its core. You start to feel that the earth is not your true home. It might not be worth knowing in a way that would lead to loving, in a way that would lead to protecting and conserving. So I've tried to suggest that it was this experience of radical guilt that made Pelagianism the heresy threatening the church in the 16th century. And Luther's Augustinian notes on grace and God taking the initiative and giving faith were very powerful antidotes to that threat. For us, I think it's different. The notion that the earth is not our true home. That God, if present at all, exists in a distant heaven, or even in the progress of history. This is Gnosticism. And I do think that Luther's theology, especially his understanding of creation, provides us with enormous resources to address uh, this threat as well but I shall have to keep you somewhat in suspense until tomorrow's lecture to share with you what I think that means. So I, I will uh, stop there tonight. Thank you very much for uh, uh, allowing me to, to be Andy Rooney for just one night. I promise I won't tomorrow. Thank you.